So anything from last week, from chapter 17, that uh, you were pondering and thought about or a question that was still lingering that we could uh, finish up from 17 as we move on to 18 today? Oh, I forgot. And it, because I know several people do watch this as I, I looked at it this late last week. I want to greet you and welcome you to our class today, wherever you are and whoever you are. Uh, so welcome this morning as we turn to chapter 18 of Acts. Do you know they're there? Uh, I watched, there isn't any actually anybody there live, but I watched uh, part of the class to see how it was picked up uh, on the microphone, and there were about 14 people that watched it at some point last week, so uh, on uh, on YouTube. So it is amazing. It is amazing. So. So if I if I teach any heresy, it's around forever, <laughs> which that's always a little scary. Uh, anything from last week at all? Anybody come with a question? All right. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we had a speaker from Augsburg College that uh, was with us for our adult ed time uh, yesterday after the services yesterday. And uh, she came and she brought a conversation around how do we have interfaith conversations? How do we relate to the reality that the world has come? And when the world has come, they come with different ideas and philosophies, different religious aspects, different understandings of God and how they approach their relationship with God. And it's interesting because as I was driving home, I was thinking, uh, you know, because I done some uh, uh, preparation for class today, and I was thinking, interesting that that conversation has some implications to this conversation that we're going to have and will have and continue to have and have had as we think about what Paul's missionary missions have been and how Paul has gone out to share this good news of the gospel. And in the, the Acts, there's some actually in the, our passage for today where I'm trying to sort out in my own ministry, my own life, my own walk with Jesus, my own uh, experience of trying to relate to the world around me as I meet Jewish brothers and sisters, as I meet Muslim brothers and sisters, as I meet those who have no religious or care about God at all. I, I We have to, I have to continue to ask those questions of what it is that we have to offer, what it is is our responsibility in terms of what we know and experience and what God has done in our lives. And so we're going to, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the context of today, because it's I think there's a, a part of this passage that kind of challenges that a bit. Um, so uh, let's start uh, yeah. with uh, verses uh, one through. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, just yeah, you got to yell at me. Just no, yell at me. That's just great stuff we thought. You know, that, uh, as we look at seventeen, uh, you know, there's there's two things that we notice about that is that um, Paul was yeah. Take the white noise out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Paul was respectful, and yet he didn't say, yeah, I doubt you, that's fine. What's your takeaway from that? For you you personally, in terms of your that, own? That, that as you interface with other people, always show respect, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to succumb to their belief. Let's let's unpack that just a bit because I, I I love what you just said and I, I I wholeheartedly believe that as well that, that there isn't a challenge for me to necessarily get you up know, but let's unpack the respect part let's think about that for a second what does it mean to be respectful in a conversation with someone that has a different opinion than me well first of all he came out you know he knew their writings he knew uh, uh, some of where they were coming from. You know, he looked around the city when he first came in and was disgusted, but uh, so he wasn't happy with where he was at. But, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he shows up with his convictions, his moral standards, his understanding of life, his uh, relationship with God and what he believes God's standard for him and his life is, and now he's in an environment that's very different. So how, how does he maintain, how does he try to maintain that respect level, recognizing that that foreign or hostile environment that he's in? He's not tearing down their beliefs. He's giving his own. Yeah. But, 
accurate? Yeah, I, I believe that's true. Yeah. And then he's not calling them names. He's yeah. not calling them names. He's not <laughs> uh, and again, we don't, this is where I often wish, and as a communicator, I take some <laughs> liberty, is what's in between the lines that we have in written scripture? Like, was Paul saying, did he lead into, into conversations like that? But what if? Or I wonder, or could it be? Is there some questions in mind? Is there opportunities for there to be an invitation to the dialogue as opposed to <laughs> wrong, <laughs> change, look more like me, uh, you're stupid? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we weren't allowed to use that word in my house when I was growing up. So. Uh, any other? Thoughts about that? What what does a respectful conversation look like, or what are some of the dynamics that would happen within a respectful conversation? I think uh, you have to start with curiosity uh, about the others, uh, and, and take a uh, what I would say is a, uh, a listening posture. Um, to just, you know, I think that's where you know if we're going to love our neighbor, we have to know our neighbor, right? And, and to know our neighbor, we have to ask them questions to understand what it is. That they're like. What's their day look like? What do they do? You know, the, the scripture um, has the highlights and and, and, and sort of the, the the top top level. Uh, after there's been, I imagine, some curious questions along the way. And Paul also comes from a background of having been, you know, um, raised in this environment. And so, um, you know, if I go and speak to a a Muslim neighbor, um, I've got all kinds of just wonderings and uh, and uh, I'm just like well. Tell me what your day looks like. You know, what is what is a holy day for you? Or yeah. you know, you know, what's your favorite food? <laughs> or what do you do when you want to play with your kids? Where do you take them? Um, uh, uh, to me, those are questions that then inform me how I might be able to um, uh, love first. <laughs> uh, I guess with, with love, which I think is uh, curiosity and wonder. I wonder. I wonder. It feels like that curiosity has re re uh, reemerged in our conversations. That was not a word that I used very often, probably until like five years ago, and that has re-entered my realm of of operating in the world. That that word of curiosity. How about if we showed up with some curiosity? If you're in more of a homogeneous environment, you don't have to be as curious because you kind of already know, and if you don't, you just kind of fill in the blanks. But if you're not in that environment, if there really is some diversity that's amongst us, then how are you going to know? How are you going to learn? Will you just keep maintaining and expect the other to come your way? Or do we need to lead with some kind of level of curiosity? If we back up a chapter, Paul, as he entered into this world that was very different with all the Greek gods, he, he did enter in with some curiosity. And that curiosity brought him to that that unknown God, that unknown, unnamed God, which began his conversation. You know, I, I want to talk about that one. Of, of all places, to be good to start. So, and I wonder if that was curiosity that that, that brought me to that place. What, what's going on here? Other thought, thoughts about that? What? Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, we talked yesterday, and one of the ideas that came up at the end was trying to understand through different in different faith traditions. What is God trying to do there? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a way of, I think as I said yesterday, I think that's a good way of looking at it. You know, we're not saying necessarily we want to convert to that or anything else, but what is God trying to do to that? Or maybe where do people see God in that faith tradition? <laughs> That we can learn from. I was telling Jeff after the class yesterday uh, that uh, as I was going on one of my mission trips, uh, that's going to be in a very non Christian environment. Uh, one of the things that he said to me was to, to go with the question, leading with the question of uh, what if all truth is God's truth? What if all truth is God's truth where it's not? What if God isn't just limited to the boundaries that we often put in certain circumstances and situations? That God actually can work outside of that. That Christendom, that that as followers of Jesus, that we don't have all the answers, 
all the clarity around who God is that God could even be bigger than that. That was really helpful for me because I get I walk into that circumstance with more questions and options and, and an openness to learn more. And so for instance, uh yesterday, I think for a few people that were in that class, one of the things that she was talking about at Oxford that they have a significant portion of their class of their uh, student body is Muslim, but varieties of Muslims. So there are some that are very devout Muslims, and so they need to pray five times a day, and the, the school needs to make allowances for that. So they need to have the, the ceremonial washing stations, and they need to have those places where they can actually go, and they need to make allowances so those people can do classes at different times in order to do that, because it's not exact. In terms of the timing, it's not exact. It based, it's based on sunrise and sunset and how they put those five prayer times together. <laughs> a lot of people say that. Right? So, and so how, how, do they, how do they orientate their life around that? And then there's other Muslims that aren't at the bottom of that. And so they're not giving up and leaving class to go. And so people who are on the outside looking in and going, I thought you were a Muslim. But that's also like saying, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> And you're like, well, I am a Christian of this persuasion or that persuasion. I'm a Protestant. I'm a Catholic. So, anyway. <laughs> so when you start to think about, you know, the, that question that Jeff, you just were talking about is, is what does that mean? Where can we find God in that? Is there something we could actually learn? I mean, think about the devoutness of some of the conservative Muslims. It can be a bit humbling when you think about it. Well, I think about my own scripture reading, my own prayer life, my own giving of alms, and my own care of my neighbor. And I think, hmm, I, I, think I can lean that direction a little bit better. I can learn from those brothers and sisters. Yeah. Uh, just one other thought is, as we think about this, uh, we also need to ask our own selves, what, what do I believe and why do I believe it? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, is it just something I was taught, or does it actually have some foundation in scripture? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now you're just getting crazy. <laughs> I got my, I have my beliefs. I, if they're pretty well versed and they're very clear, are you saying at some points along the way I need to maybe stop and rethink those at times? Wait a minute. <laughs> Because wait a minute, I as I look back over my last 25 or 30 years, I'm the exact same follower of Jesus I was then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I like my own experience, I should should teach me, right? That every once in a while it's not bad to go, why do I believe that? Or why do I believe that so so fervently that 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 alienates or or creates criticism or 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 just Dig in and heal. You know, but like, also, can you explain what you believe to somebody else? That's a big gap. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling a, a couple of premier of counseling the other day you know, that that good communication is when the person you're trying to communicate can communicate clearly what you are trying to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought to myself, as I said that, I looked at him like, but who does that? <laughs> but that's that's how good communication is. That's the only way you know communication. You're going to have to keep moving here. Yeah. I know, because I haven't started in 18 yet. <laughs> Holy macro. So, someone want to read the first four verses in uh, chapter 18? Someone want to read the first four verses. And again, in classes that I lead, pronunciation does not count. So, Suzanne will read. Awesome. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Your voice got lower. <laughs> After this, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila from Hunters, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together by trade. They were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue God, and try to convince Jews and Greeks. So, what do we learn about Paul in these first few verses of chapter 18? Anything? Yeah, tent maker. 
which uh, many, many commentaries have questioned maybe it's a broader, that he's actually probably a, a leather worker, that he works with leather, not just with tents, but often there's that association that he's a tent maker, which is interesting because of the, at, lots of research, uh, there's a, a, a specific kind of leather that is used not just for tents and not, it's used for curtains and it's used for a variety of other home um, uh, issues uh, and uh, uses. And that was a, a form of leather that actually Paul grew up around. It was from kind of his hometown area, which is interesting. So he uh, meets up with this couple. They're both, they're all tent makers and uh, they form that relationship around the, their, their, their chosen line of work. It's interesting in the Jewish culture, culture for a rabbi, a rabbi was never meant to be a burden to the people around it. It was never spent, uh, expected that, that they would pay him to preach, that they would pay him to, to teach, they would pay him to kind of hold them to the letter of the law. And so there was always this notion that they had to kind of pay their way. They would give them the respect that they deserve because of the learning that they've done and, and the process of setting aside some time for them to continue to, to learn so that they can continue to be good shepherds. But the, the notion was uh, that they would be tent makers. I just would. figured out how we can get our budget to be balanced. <laughs> we stop paying any of the staff. Exactly. And let's see the commitment level then. <laughs> see if they still show up. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's interesting that we learned some history of this because uh, uh, Aquila, was, uh, they were kicked out of Rome, and that was because of Claudius. That was, is the history of, he was the uh, emperor in AD 49. He uh, was tired of all the Jewish conflicts that they were having. And so he says, I'm just going to cleanse all of Rome. All, all the Jews have to leave. And so that was one of three uh, Roman cleansings where they kicked all the Jews out. And so that was the reason why uh, they, they left and now they're in Corinth. Um, I, I go back to your comment, Jeff. Uh, is I, I wonder what the church would be like if we hadn't moved to more of a professional understanding of a, a clergy. Uh, I wonder what that would look like in terms of how clergy would show up. I wonder how that would be in terms of the impact that they would have on community because they were it was a little bit less of the from up here pulpit to alongside walking with. Uh, also, because you'd be seeing them in the places. What what if, you know, what if I worked with Indy at the Jerry's every week and you had to see how I was actually operating in real life uh, as you came through my line? Or, or what if I worked at the gas station here somewhere? Or what if you had to come and buy something from me uh, and how I went about my business? And that it was I actually living out my values, living out my views. It's easy for us in many times as clergy until some big scandal happens or get every year sin becomes really public, it's really easy to kind of hide behind this notion that people have the respect that people will give this position. So, uh, and I, I, I learned that very early in my in my journey uh, that, that we have to be very careful. We have to be more, more than just careful. Being above reproach because the consequences are so great. Yeah, there, were, there was a group, uh, a mission group called the Tent Makers. Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, that was this was their uh, platform. And you kind of worked your way uh, mm -hmm. within a mission team. Yep. Uh, and tent makers trained youth pastors. Uh, and what they would do <laughs> is they would uh, connect with churches who would hire these folks part time, and then they would work in the community doing something else. So uh, they're not a real active group any longer. I don't think that was a, a well, see, that was well established. They, they were at the grand back in the 80s. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, the regional the regional tent maker worked out of uh, Good Shepherd over here in Hopkins. So, yeah, we are Shepherd. All right, let's move on. Before let's... you do, the last line of, of what Suzanne read. And he argued in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Greeks. How does that fit with what we talked about yesterday? Thank you, because I had it underlined and I was going to move on. So thank you for talking <laughs> that. Uh, why don't you give a thought? What do you think? And then I have no idea. That's so 
So verse four, every Sabbath, he would argue in the, in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. Here, here's my takeaway. That's not telling you the story. That is much less than just telling the story. Here's, here's how I thought about it. Is I wonder if maybe what he did, because of what we saw in the chapter before this, is did maybe he appointed uh, uh, appealed to the the void that their religious practice left. Maybe when he looked at, at at all the Greek gods and how they spent all their time to appease, appease these Greek gods, and they never felt like they were ever at a place where they could kind of take a breath because if they were to make some of the gods mad or they were gonna the consequences was going to be a, a failed crop and all those kinds of things that then maybe it was to appeal to them and say, well, there is a piece of you can have. There is a compliment you can have. There is something more that you can have. Or to the Jews, he wasn't talking to the Jews here, but talking to the Jews, where he's like, you, you've been waiting for this Messiah. You've been waiting. You've been posturing yourself in such a way, waiting for this Messiah. Here's the good news. The Messiah has come. You, you can live in the now the Messiah has come world, as opposed to waiting for, and, and what that represented in the, the letter of the law, those kinds of things. So, so maybe it's it's the conversation of the curiosity and say, how can I offer this good news to you in a way that's going to help further where you are on your faith journey? But no, just just that uh, the Greeks um, perhaps have already abandoned their idolatry and uh, are now God fearers and looking for um, the. God of Israel, and so uh, they've joined themselves to the synagogue. So you're thinking he, he, he might be talking to a specific audience that would have been more receptive. That that are already at the synagogue. So they're already gathering in worship. That's a very good point. That's a very good, that's a good observation. Yep. Every Sabbath he would argue in the synagogue he would try to convince Jews and Greeks. The question is, convince, convince them of what specifically we don't know, but we can guess based on his other. But, yeah, when I read this, some of it is, you know, in, in my own experience, the word argue always hits me funny, right? Because if someone's going to argue with me, um, that immediately makes me a little uh, upset. <laughs> um, and so, so, so one of my questions is, you know, are, how else could that be translated? That, how would they translate landed on argue? Uh, the other is just the setting of that, right? I think that the um, um, uh, arguing might be different than uh, theology and community. Uh, it seems like the rabbinical teaching, there was invitation to converse and, as opposed to church, where it is, or, you know, Christian church, where it is top down led. Um, while there are priests and rabbis, it always seems like there's this opportunity for sort of um, wrestling with that together, which usually doesn't happen in our um, in our own church faith here as much. And yep. so, um, I don't know that this is uh, uh, culturally different to what they might experience. I think what they're hearing might be different. Um, and so uh, uh, I think to me, it sounds like they're wrestling together hmm. uh, as opposed to arguing. You know, because this sounds the way I, you know, when I say, when I hear the word argue, I think it's just one way directional, right? That, 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 that you know, I can interpret this as Paul being the only voice. And I doubt that that's there. Um, and so I, I hear a conversation that's wrestling with some very uh, important things for them in their community. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it just seems like it's more of a, a space for curiosity to say, well, what about this? And here's, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, I, I really like that. I, think, that kind of an idea. I, I wonder if you're right, not correct about that, because we uh, argue is one of those words that we often think is like this angry, heels dug in. What Future if, on the sidewalk on the box with his megaphone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe it was more dialogue. Maybe it was uh, more invitational in regard to like, you know, uh, conflict is another word like that, where we, when we think of conflict, we, in, we immediately think of angry and forceful and those kinds of things. The conflict by definition is just two different opinions than me. Two different opinions than me. Argue could be that place as well, where we are we have some ideas and thoughts about it. And now we're in dialogue with each other, but we're intentionally having some dialogue. Right. Yeah, my inner linear went with persuading. Yeah, persuading the Jews. And Eugene Peterson translates this as doing his best to convince both Jews and Greeks about Jesus. 
Well, if you've got a strong argument, you're going to try to do some convincing, right? You're going to convince them, but I mean, that has a different uh, shift than arguing. You don't necessarily try to convince somebody about Jesus by arguing with them. You just tell yeah. the story. Anyway. Again, I think that, that suggests a certain tense in which you're bringing it to a certain a fervor that you're bringing to that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's something coming. But, yeah, I, trust me, that wasn't lost on me as well. Thinking of how do we, and we're going to get to a little bit more of that because I'm going to share a couple of stories uh, as we get up the same section. So, um, Suzanne, do you want to return the favor and ask you have to read the next section for us? <laughs> <laughs> how many verses? Let's read five through eleven. Okay, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word. Now here he's just proclaiming the word. Okay. Preaching. Testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own head. I am innocent from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. <laughs> That's a nice thing. Okay. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titus. Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. He stayed there a year and six months, mm -hmm. teaching the word of God among them. So had we just stopped with the first uh, four verses, we probably could have found some safe ground to have that conversation that we were just having. But now... We've got your blood's on your own head. I shake off every <clears throat> one commentary talked about fervently shook his cloak as an example of saying, I've done my best to, to give you my best word, my best message, and you just are resisting that. So I'm going to move on to a new onto a new uh, group of people that I can share with Dr. Bose. Oh, I just said audience. A new audience. Thank you. I can use help with those words for sure. Uh, <clears throat> that seems like more angry. That seems more forceful. That seems more like you're so wrong and you just won't get it. So, to heck with you. Um, there was a term back in the 80s uh, that was going through uh, evangelical youth ministry um, um, circuits that uh, it was a term called shining. And they were teaching and empowering kids as they were sharing the gospel with their friends at school that if the kid didn't want to hear it and didn't, wasn't interested, you would just shine them. And that, and that definition was to turn away. And I thought, what? Oh, like, we only have so much time in this life. We only have so much opportunity. We're going to use these opportunities. If they're open to them, we'll give them the gospel. We'll invite them to come to youth group. We'll you know, see the transformation. And they're like, if they say no, then I'm interested. Then you shine it and you move on. And I thought, that, that doesn't sound right to me. <clears throat> I don't think that's the way Jesus like some of the Amish used to do. If somebody didn't follow exactly their trip, I think that was, was shiny. No, that was, that was, that was shiny. similar to that, yeah, yeah. where you just turn away and they're not considered part Family. of you at all. We don't want to sound we'd rather shine. That's right. Because look, you know, it's interesting because that's good, right? In, um, in direct opposition to kind of the philosophy that I had grown up with is that people come to faith because of the gentle nudge of a trusted friend. It was that notion that you, you'll walk your walk and those opportunities are you shared your opinion, shared your ideas, you know, with those people that you would share them with along the journey. And you know, they left it up to God to figure all the rest of that out. To actually have a whole group of people that you are now shining, depending how forceful that youth group could have been in that in local school. I mean, oh, macro. I don't even want to think about what the consequences of that idea. Go ahead. But um, so you got Matthew 10 and uh, he's sending out uh, disciples. Oh, yeah. And some dust settling there. Yeah. And whatever city or town you enter, 
uh, go to those that are worthy. And when you come into a house, salute it. You know, offer your peace to it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever uh, receives you uh, shall not receive you and not hear your words. Depart and shake the dust off your feet. So, so there, there is a little bit of reflection from deeper than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a mandate, there's a, a direction, clarity around the, the disciples' role, the early church's role. Uh, so, so I wonder, curiosity, I wonder, you know, the, the Messiah has now come, entered in this long awaited work of God has not come to the world for the Jews that they were anticipating, they were waiting. And obviously, we know as we look back that Jesus came in a very different way. So it's very difficult for this, especially for the Jews to go, yeah, we get that. That we looks just like we're waiting for, we accept that we're ready to go. I wonder, as we have to oftentimes do as we're reading scripture, and I don't know the answer, I'm wondering with you, is is this is it the timing issue? Is this a moment issue? Is is this good news that now we're in a new way into the world, and now we're trying to get that message out in a first century reality of, of, of the world? And how's that going to happen? It's going to happen by people visiting those towns. It's going to happen by conversations. It's going to happen in dialogues in places where people are open to having conversations around spiritual things uh, in, the, in the marketplace or in the synagogue in some of those places. Is, is this a mandate? Hey, we're trying to get this message out. And so there needs to be a little bit of fervor. And if people aren't really open to it, if the spirit's not kind of creating a space for that, then we move on to the next place. But it seems like there's kind of an angry, kind of a kind of a judgment part of that. And I think that's what's empowered the church for a long time is to think about it that way. Is that we have this righteous indignation to stand in judgment, even though there's other passages that say we're not supposed to judge. That you know, be careful about that, you know, log in your own eye. I mean, it's pretty clear. And, and that's a passage that easily preaches, you know, love the neighbor, love the Lord your God first, and then love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it gets kind of confusing to go, what's our role as the church with this good news of, of God at work in our midst and the transformation that literally happened in our own life? If we uh, you know, let's uh, Let Jeff, I'm coming back to you. you. You think of the sower, uh, he sows the seed. And falls on different ground. We can all be at different ground at different times in our life. And so it's not always, we're not always part to the gospel. That's I'm coming back to you, Jeff. That's kind of where I found my solace in this is that is that is that image of the soul, is the end of the soul, and that image of this bag of seeds, this amazing life that was in this bag that get down into the soil and the sun would do its job and the rain would come, there would be a crop and people would eat and they, you know, they would sustain their own. I mean, and that the job of the sower even in that first century understanding of it, you know, was to get those seeds into the ground as best as they're able. Um, and I go, if, if at the end of the day, I'm not saving anybody anyway, then really there has to be a work of the spirit at work in those and the creed and openness for you know, just like the ground had that little crisp that seed to get in. Then my job is just to offer the seed mm -hmm. and to offer the seed not in a way that's going to repel that seed, mm -hmm. but to create a space where there could be some openness to it. So that's where I've got my solace step that here. Well, I'm just, I hate to be cheating here, but I'm looking at the Bible. He <laughs> <laughs> just says in. Quoted in all of the Synoptic Gospels as they go and tell your story. And if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. So he's, he seems to say, kind of go in and give it a shot. But if you don't find any reception, move on. Now, here they talk about they were there a year and a half. So obviously they got a pretty good reception, but you know, I mean, it's okay to move on, You apparently, according well, to Jesus. we got Crispus, the official of the synagogue, who becomes a, a believer, 
and literally gets baptized, there's going to be some consequences for that. I'm going to have to continue on with that. Somebody have a comment over there? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, please. I was just going to say that um, I've taken a Bible study that's called Paradox. Oh. And the idea yeah, yeah. is there's many places in the Bible where it says this and says that. And it's not that you choose one or the other, taking the best off or arguing or whatever. You hold both intentions. You can believe both sides of a paradox. And um, and you hold them in intention. And that's kind of a, I'll call the maturing of your faith. Because when you first start out, you learn these things and you learn them by road and you don't have experience with how they operate. But eventually you get to the point where you understand how these two sides can be held in tension at the same time. Not very comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> living in the tension of the paradox. Because you're like, I want to have the answer. I want it to be very clear. But then I can, I can stand yeah. firmly on that. If I have to continue to try to figure out, my only solace in that is, is I'm I'm a finite human being trying to understand an infinite God. So that's a paradox in and of itself from the get-go. The creator and the creation. I'm the creation. And so am I going to be able to figure it all out? Am I going to have all the answers? Am I going to no? And now I'm trying to follow a, a religion of 2,000 years ago. I'm trying to follow the understanding of how this happen in that world, this miraculous intervention of God in the world, and try to understand what those teachings were that were focused on a very specific group of people in a very specific context that now I'm trying to translate 2,000 years later into world that's five years ago was different, let alone today in 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's why we have to wrestle. It's why we have to go, but couldn't it? But shouldn't it? What does that mean? How does that work? Let me show you how this is working out in my life and we wrestle with it. But again, Christendom has not been very receptive to that notion. It's get your answers, get it clear. And if you don't have the right answers, then you should go somewhere else because we've got the right answers. Either you get on board here or go find some place that's going to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Follow. I was just going to say, you know, an example would be Jesus as king, all the images of Jesus as king, and then as the suffering servant. So, yeah. You have to wrestle with that and figure out how that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Which was one of the big issues for the Jews, right? right. Yeah. Is there another comment? All right. Uh, so, do, do we ever see a context? Do we ever understand a place where your blood be on your own heads. So I am innocent from now on. I'm going to get up. Can you think of an example of that? That actually how that would play out in your life, in any kind of your day to day experience? Yeah, I couldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where, where is that going to happen? Now, I, I've seen it happen. I've been in search of where it did happen. Uh, but yeah, so. So, but here's here's an example. Yes. Sometimes I wonder if, you know, it's never happened in my life this explicitly. Like, you know, I've never said your blood be on your on your own head. I did this and no, no, we're going to the, uh, to the Gentiles. I have heard, you know, I've uh, uh, I've heard this um, encouraged in, in youth group kind of setting um, in the dining of the Jesus tribe. Um, and so while I haven't uh, verbalized it in this way, I think there is a piece of that sort of Still wants to live in me that then gives me permission not to continue to love mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and and so I wrestle with that um, and, and then I have to decide so what uh, what's what's the best what's going to be you know if I'm going to love my neighbor as myself how's that going to how does I how do I wrestle with that so again I don't I've never said to me I'm well through you um, mm -hmm. I'm going to take my message to someone else that's more receptive. But I think there's a, a tone sometimes in scripture that we can use that to say, yeah, it's not on me, it's on you, so I'm, I'm out of here. So I, I think there's a subtlety to it that that can that we can that we can exhibit without the verbiage. Mm -hmm. I I'm just it's constantly to recall there's a past, I think it's from Ezekiel, and it talks about the watchman. And you know, if a watchman sees a danger covered. It doesn't make sound the alarm. 
um, then uh, it's his fault. But if if those that hear the alarm and don't do it, then the blood's on them. I appreciate that because uh, I've actually preached on that passage. And in the, one of the illustrations, I don't remember exactly all the purposes that I used in that sermon, but I remember the illustration that I used is that, and, and that's, hap that's happened in this building. <clears throat> the tornado warning alarm went off, you know, that loud noise, everybody knows what it is. And the choir was going, there were classes that were happening, there was youth ministry happening in the building, and all went. Okay, so let's go back a little bit. You know, even though the alarm was going off. Yeah. Or a fire alarm. Do you think there's really a fire? I'm not going to be I don't see any trucks outside. I'm smelling smoke. I'm going to stay where I am. Is that people can do what they want, right? It doesn't mean that the alarms weren't there warning people. The alarms are there to say, go to that safe place. The alarms were there to say, make sure that you're in a position that you're not in jeopardy any longer. But at the end of the day, we still get to choose. But the alarms are there to give warning, right? That there's something that's there. Well, at, at nine on 9-11, in one of the buildings after the plane hit, you know, there was a broadcast, stay in your office. Oh. <laughs> well, there really was, you, you know, know and that robbed some people of the encouragement to make a quick exit and get down the stairs, you know, 115 floors or whatever. And some people died because they followed the instructions. Yeah. 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 I know. I know it's uh, and and you think about all those kind of complications. My uncle uh, was thrown out of a car in a car accident uh, because he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and he that till the day he died said that's why I'm never wearing a seatbelt <laughs> because had I been wearing a seatbelt I'd been killed in a car accident. So I'm never going to wear a seatbelt. <laughs> it, it's so in some ways that illustrates how we get so sure of something from an experience or an understanding. And then we was no more reason after that. But you, on the other hand, got a message to not move. I'm going to tell that story. It was a good message. I'm going to tell that story in a minute. Uh, so, so, so he leaves the synagogue and goes and and ends up in this conversation with uh, Titus uh, Justice, worship. And he ends up in the house right next to the synagogue. Crispus, an official of the synagogue, becomes a believer. That had to have an impact on the local Jewish population. We're all seeing this transformation. It's not only him, it's him and his household. We uh, and many of the and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized, probably because of the transformation. Hey, if he can find understanding in that, we should probably listen to that. And so things are happening. Transformation is happening. And then one night, the Lord says to Paul in a vision. Okay, if Paul needs more righteous indignation, if he needs more fervor, if he needs more, you know, passion for what he's called to do, if the road to Damascus wasn't enough in, in all the ways that God has saved him along the journey already, here's another. He has a vision. It's clear. Do not be afraid. And we know that he believed it in such a way because he stayed there for a year and a half longer. So I started thinking about that. And Experiences, circumstances, situations bring some level of certainty. And once we get to that place of certainty, then there are, there's no reason to keep asking questions. There's no reason to still be open. There's no reason to be curious anymore because now I'm certain and I'm certain. So uh, I had a conversation with our, our guest speaker yesterday as we were walking up the hall. And matter of fact, I think I even mentioned it a bit uh, in, in our class is. When, when we are approaching the world and it's different beliefs and different understandings, and we, we have come to our faith by a variety of means, by, by our transformed life, by experiences where we saw God at work in our life, where we saw or felt like we were led by God's spirit, where there's been a miracle that's happened in our place. I'll put that in quotes because I believe in miracles. I've seen miracles. Uh, Believe in miracles. Believe God is at work in this world. Why God doesn't work in miracles all the time in all kinds of circumstances. Why those things don't end up in the same place we want them every single time. Lots and lots of questions. But 
But I've had two very distinct experiences where God showed up in my life. God showed up in my life. When I was uh, the summer before my senior year in high school, we were uh, about 90 miles outside of Juneau, Alaska, with an organization called Team Missions. It's my very first mission trip. We went to Merritt Island, Florida, where we had boot camp. We got trained for 10 days to go do these mission trips. We learned all kinds of skills and things like that. And then people flew, flew off, drove off, uh, all, to go all kinds of places in the world. And they were like, they had two boot camps, one early and one later in the, in the year. And I think they sent out a thousand kids that year. We got in a bus and drove from Merritt Island, Florida, all the way up to Juneau, Alaska, <laughs> yeah. driving 24 hours a day. That's a real yeah. road yeah. trip. Yeah. That yeah. was a road trip. Yeah. All the way through the United States, up through the Alcan. The Alcan wasn't even paid fully yet at that time. Uh, and there's lots of stories that come out of that. But um, when we got to this camp, we uh, uh, rotated uh, with the work that we do, we were doing. And so we all had a day off each week. And so we had seen in the uh, office of the camp manager an aerial photograph of the camp and the area around it. And the ocean was on one side, and then there was a mountain range uh, about a mile from the camp at the end. And at the top of one of these mountain areas was a lake. And I said, small lake, and I said to the camp director, I said, what's the name of that lake? And he goes, I don't know. He says, I don't know if anybody's ever even been up there. I suppose, I suppose some of the, the, the native people around here probably have, but as far as I know, there's no name. So my, my friend, myself, and two others on this uh, team said to ourselves, oh, oh we're going to go Christopher Columbus this. So we're going to go take our day off. I mean, how hard can it be to go find a lake at the top of the mountain? I mean, how hard can that be? So we're going to go and take our day off, get up early, and we're going to go find this thing. We'll be back by the end of that. I'm just shortening the story. Yeah. We kept going, we've got to be close. We've got to be close. We, we knew there was a kind of a drop dead time where we had to turn back where we were going to get back before dark. But the last thing the camp director said was, do not be out there after dark. Make sure you're back. Long story short, it's getting dark. And then we're, we're coming down, but it's we're a long way from down. And now it's pitch black, and the three of us are holding hands as we're walking. And at one point, as clear as anybody in this room talking to me, I heard the word stop. And I said to the guys, I said, I think we should just stop. I think I mean, we're never going to find our way down in the dark. It's just it's too dangerous. Scared about bears and all that stuff too, but I thought, yeah, so stop. And we just sat there and we kind of fell asleep and kind of. And, and I remember we woke up at the dawn, you know, the sun was coming up. And we got up and we stood up. And right where Jeff is, is sitting, there was about a 200 foot drop straight down. <laughs> the other two guys said, Why did we stop here? And I said, Because I heard a clear word that said, Stop. <clears throat> and so we did. Did you tell them that the night before that you had heard a word? No, I just convinced them to stop in those two. But it was his clear day. So how do you how do you discount that experience in your life? How do you go? Something. I mean, <laughs> coincidence. We, we're the, now, why don't we always get those kinds of things? Why doesn't that always happen in those circumstances? Why do people fall into situations, circumstances that don't get that word stop? I don't know. I wish I did, but I do know for a fact that it was clear in my in my in my understanding that there was that word stop. And the evidence was if we they kept walking, we would walk right off that cliff. Mm. We'd walk left. Fast mm -hmm. forward. Other experiences I can share, but fast forward. Eight years ago, I was on sabbatical and I was driving to go work on my the thesis I was working on at that time. And I got in a car accident and I found out later that it broke my neck. But I didn't know that at that time. All I knew is I hit a minivan. I I got caught in the snow behind a snow plow and it drew it forced me into the oncoming traffic. And all I knew is I hit a minivan. So in my mind, there's a mom and some kids in that minivan. We're going to say so I'm going to go check on them. But this voice was so clear. Don't move. Don't move. I mean, it was so clear. Everything in my body is saying, there's somebody in that other car that's going to need your help, baby. 
I mean, it's almost a head-on collision. And I just I just leaned against the door and just waited for help. And I heard later that if I had tried to move, I would have completely severed my neck and I would have been there by four sure. I had the same break that uh, Christopher Reese had mm -hmm. between the one and two. Um, mm -hmm. Why? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I, I wish I had that answer, but I know. So now I, I think in my own life, I think <laughs> about when this, I have at least a couple of experiences, and there's a few more that says, you know, I, I can't not believe there's a God. I cannot believe, I cannot not believe that there is an intimate relationship with God and God's creation, meaning me. I cannot not believe that there is answers to prayers. There is leading of the spirit. There, I, can't, I can't discount that in my own life. And so that gives me a confidence in my faith, not an arrogance, but a confidence. I could easily get to arrogance because for the macro, I got all this proof that God is giving me. There's love for me, blah, 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 blah. I could get to that point. So, so then if I have this conviction, how do I not take that to a place where I go, you have to know this. You have to believe this. It's this life changing transformational. You need to know this. Oh, you don't want to know this? <laughs> how, does, how does that not translate to that? And, and how does that not, why the church, how does it not translate to the way the church often has operated in the world and operated in other people's lives? What do we do with that? Lots. God sort of, at least to my experience, sends people in your path that turn out to be like, what if he know to send the right person? Because one time when I was in a bad car wreck, this is in the 1970s, so no cell phones, no nothing, you know, and it was a pretty bad one where I was almost stuck in the car with my clothes. And the one person that had a Jerry rigged tarpon that he had built himself from a heat pit in his Rambler American <laughs> sedan stopped. And I didn't even know that he had that, that nobody nobody knew what a car phone, unless you were a goldfinger, was. Yeah. And he had this, you know, it had a rotary dial on it and it was all connected up so that he could call from his car. <laughs> Now, the chances of one a million of someone that happened to have one of those to just come and stop and say, can you, because, you know, I had to call the hospital, I had to call my parents, you know, it was a pretty bad. So I was thinking, there had to be somebody, some guardian angel wiping a fever brow saying, we need to send that particular person to help him. And a lot of other times when I just had, well, you know, Typical getting stuck in the snow and that kind of thing on the way back to college from here, which is always a 200 mile trek. And at Christmas time, there was always a snowstorm. The first farmhouse that I had knocked on the door always had somebody home that had compassion and brought his tractor out and helped me. You know, it was just amazing because I kept thinking when it happened, oh, there's no one around, I'm stranded. But it all seemed like the first place. So I think that has to be divine intervention. I don't think that's coincidence. Go ahead. Appreciate that. Um, I know that uh, working as a chaplain in the intensive care unit, um, I have seen people of many faiths uh, pray for healing and miracles. And um, sometimes those prayers have been answered, and sometimes they have not. Um, and so um, when I enter into these conversations, um, if you have to, I might go, so tell me about your, the dreams that you dream. Tell me about what you have, uh, what your God has done for you. Um, because in my own um, understanding, I, I really believe that it's our God, the world's God, and we all have these sort of different um, interpretations of that um, on some level. Um, but that's where I start. Um, and, and so, uh, again, I always enter into the, um, we have the ultimate truth conversation with a little bit of gentleness and wonder. Because um, so experiences are very powerful. Personal experiences are very yep. powerful. Yep. And I, in you know, my first introduction to to uh, Jesus and uh, Spirit and God, uh, was growing up in an alcoholic family, and somehow I knew to cry out to God for healing of our family. I never was church. I just had this experience of I know that there is something here for me to cry out to, mm -hmm. and and will hear me and hold me. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where the base of my faith, my Christian faith, started. Um, um, but I think that faith, uh, uh, again, I, I, I hold these kind of conversations carefully because these experiences are powerful, and the people that we're talking to have had very powerful experiences as well. Yeah, I, 
I really, I really appreciate your story. I, I didn't know that part of your story. And that that sense of a God presence in your life that was unmistakable and clear. I mean, that a, a great testimony of God's faithfulness and God's coming to us. Other comment question? Then keep moving on. Um, but before we do, I think I think one of the takeaways from this little section is. So Paul gets this vision, but the vision isn't so that he can, at least in this text, it's not necessarily so that he now can, can live with this righteous indignation. It says, don't, do not be afraid to speak and do not be silent. I, I like to focus on the do not be afraid. It's for him. It's, it's for him to have a sense of confidence that he doesn't have to be afraid, that he can walk in some level of confidence. Uh, how he does it, how he shows up. I mean, also, I, I add to the you know, to the uh, comment to that statement is uh, that I don't actually have to, in order to validate and verify my own understanding of faith, my own my own beliefs. I don't have to necessarily convince you. Maybe I'd like to convince you because if it's my truth and I really believe it's true, and that can be helpful for you, then yeah. And, and I'm not actually showing up in a loving way, yeah. But at the end of the day, I don't have to have that in order for me to be okay. For for me to, to feel like I can still live my life of faith. So maybe maybe those things are those are not there so that I can lord it over someone else or show my my greater worth to God or my greater superiority because like, oh, I had this and I had the wherewithal to know that. It's more about preparing me in a confident way and preparing me in a way that. that, that Faith encouraging so that I may able to face the challenges in my own life in a way that's going to be helpful. Yeah, we wouldn't want someone to follow you in your footsteps and think they could make it down the mountain in the dark because Jeff was rescued, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, should I go on sinning so that uh, grace may abound? Strongest language in the New Testament. Right. Translated okay. hell no. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not how it's supposed to work. So should I just put God to the test? I mean, Jesus himself in the wrestling with Satan, right? Oh, jump off, right? So let's go see the let's see the angels show up. Let's go see the lake at the top of the mountain. <laughs> Why do we have to bring that up? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's forget those illustrations. They were just meant for us. Uh, let's move on to uh, 12 through 17. So I want to read 12 through 17. Yeah, go ahead. But well, when Gal um, Galio was Proconsul Arcadia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. They said, This man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, If it is a matter of crime or so serious villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it's a matter of question about words and names and your own law, see to it to yourself. I do not wish to be judged, be, I do not wish to be a judge of these men. And he dismissed them to the tribunal and then all of them seemed sophistic, sophistic, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of these things. This is a very interesting little section of scripture right there, because uh, the Jews are being very strategic here. They're, they, let's back up. Why do they need to be strategic? What's happening that is causing them to act in this way? Why, why are we now in front of the civilian governor? <laughs> well, the, the believers are, are worshiping right next to <laughs> them. They've, they've got the synagogue and then the house right next door is where they're having their house meeting. Yes. <laughs> so it's threatening their, their world. It's threatening 
the, the, the institutional church is threatening the temple. And so they're like, okay, what if this keeps going? They're all, all these Jews are going to be start followers, be followers of Jesus. And what's that going to look like in terms of the way our order and our world <laughs> operates? And so they could do what they have done in the past in, as we're going through. They could just kind of work through the local authorities. But that's only going to have a local authority. Is that they might get him to cease and desist at that time, but they're not really going to get him to cease and desist. He's going to do what he has done before. He's going to move on to some other places and continue to do this. And it's going to, it's going to continue to affect Judaism in a way that we don't want it to. It's going to, it's going to undo the work of the temple, it's going to undo the historical understanding of our role and our position and our understanding of life. And so what do they do? They decide that they're going to take it to the civilian governor because if he makes a decision that he has to stop, that's going to be a precedent that for other governors and other places where he's going to go. So they can really put a stop to him if they can get him to, to rule in their favor. But again, he doesn't work with these people. He works for Rome. And clearly, he doesn't really care about this in-house problem that they're having. You sort this out. Because he sorts it out and says, well, wait a minute. You're a Jew. He's a Jew. You guys are having problems. This is a Jewish thing. Figure it out. Because uh, I don't want to deal with this at all. Uh, and so we know that it gets to a point where he's really washed his hands because he sees, <laughs> interesting enough, one of the commentators was talking about the fact that, so you've got, you've got, Roman citizens, you've got Jewish population, strong Jewish population in, in Corinth, and then you've got a Gentile population as well, because it's a seaport and there's lots of people coming in. There's lots of industry that's there. That the Gentiles saw this as an opportunity to kind of put the Jews in the place, frustrated with the impact and the authority that they had and how they had a way of kind of impacting the life in, in Corinth. And so, they're the ones that seized this religious Jewish leader and beat him right in front of the civilian governor. And the civilian governor goes, I don't know. You can beat him up. And so, so, so who's beating it? We, we, we believe that it's a Gentile mob that seizes this Jewish leader and beats him in right in front of. And the reason why they believe Luke added this was to talk about just the opposition that was there and, and the context of which Paul's operating. That there was there was all kinds of tensions that was happening there. You got a you got a Roman governor, you've got a strong Gentile population, you've got a strong church that's there, and here's Paul. And Paul stays stays there for a year and a half in the midst of all that. But also uh... Ar Archaea is is a region, not not a county. Right. Proton. Right. Right. He's the he he's the he he speaks for Rome. Yeah. So he's got but also a region. region. Yeah. Not just that specific area. You're right. All right. Let's go on. We're, we're making some headway. Who would like to read eighteen through uh, twenty three? I would. Yay. <laughs> Paul's return to Antioch. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Tenetia, he had his hair cut, for he was <laughs> under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there. The first he himself went to the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail, sail for Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from place to place through the region of Galatia and Thuringia. By Syria, and strengthening all the disciples. So this is an interesting little piece of scripture for us as the story continues. And this this is right a reminder again. What is the Book of Acts? It's, the, it's kind of a part of the history of the way the church is going. And Paul's 
missionary uh, missions. Um, so after staying there for a considerable time, Paul says farewell to the brothers and sisters in sales for Syria. He's headed back home. He's headed back home. Uh, and so he uh, is, is anxious to go, greet, uh, go to Jerusalem. He's anxious to go back to his hometown. He's anxious to kind of finish the missionary vision, the, the mission and go back home. So he, that's where he's headed. But we also have to remember there's 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 some issues at hand here. There's weather issues. And so there's there's a, a timing of when you can sail in that region of the world. And then there's times where it's just too dangerous to sail. So people don't sail. The ships shipping stops. And so there's a timing. And sometimes if you if you push those boundaries a little bit too, you end up on the rock somewhere or you end up in a storm and you get lost. And so ship captains are very, you know, they have some drop dead times and they don't pass those times. And so if you don't get on a boat, you don't get to where you need to be. And we know that from other places throughout the book of Acts, right? Where Paul gets stranded uh, in, in places because they missed their timing. He stays a little too long. So he's maybe learned his lesson as, as, as he's there because they say, stay, stay longer. But he knows he only has his window, so he stays longer. But can you imagine? I mean, this this is like a pastor's pastor. This is a guy that is so focused on sharing this good news. And if you're interested at all, I'll spend time with you. I'll talk with you. I'll help clear out, clear up your questions. And I'll, and he's like, ah, I really need to go. So it must have been really hard for him. You know, you think about just some of the difficulties that Paul faces and some of the physical things, the, the beatings and the and the shipwreckness and all, you know, all, all the stuff that he kicked out of town and you know, all the stuff that he had to deal with. Watching his friends uh, suffer uh, from the teachings and the preaching that they were doing. But there's also a lot of this mental flow, too. He loves these people. He cares about these people. He's passionate. We see a lot of emotion in Paul, don't we, throughout the scripture? He, he has the range of emotions for sure great joy, but also great sorrow and pain. And he can get angry. He can be frustrated. Uh, he, he's a real life human being in a lot of ways. Um, so, um, so I appreciate that when we actually get to see a little bit behind the curtain and see a little bit of Paul and who he is and, 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 and understand him in that way. So uh, what I like about this part of the passage is we get a chance to stop and ask about kind of his, his personal journey of faith. There's, there's this little phrase in the middle here that talks about him being under a vow. Yeah, it's really, it's really a good thing. Uh, so um, Samson was of a very specific uh, religious uh, order. Does anybody know what it was? He was Nazareth. A, Nazareth. He was, a, he was a Nazareth. And what do we know about Nazarites? Anybody know? They don't know? cut their hair. They don't cut their hair. What else do they not do? Don't drink wine. Don't drink wine or eat meat. So there are some specific things where they set themselves apart from the rest of the culture so that they align themselves so they can be seen as and examples of a following of God. They're set apart. And in that, in that period of time, when someone wanted to kind of set aside and do kind of a, a, a religious uh, um, cleansing, if they wanted to do uh, kind of set aside some time so that they could maybe discern something or create a little bit more space for God to work in their life, where they're maybe focused on an issue or concern, they would maybe, they would take a vow. Typically that meant like 30 days where they would sit aside and they would fast from, following the tradition, they would fast from meat and they'd fast from wine and they wouldn't cut their hair. Now, I don't know about you, but I can go a month without cutting my hair and it doesn't look that dramatic. <laughs> uh, so it's not really a public thing. It's more of a personal thing. That I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not cut my hair for, for 30 days, and then there's gonna be that moment where I kind of close that vow, I bring it to a halt, and then I, I do some things. I, I break out, break from the fast, and I have some wine, and I eat some meat, and I, I have my hair cut. That's saying I'm looking back over those 30 days. Now, does something absolutely transformational happen? It's a religious practice that puts him in the right circumstances, the right mindset, and right understanding. Maybe it's just a chance for him to go, you know, maybe I've gotten myself a little too high on myself. 
Maybe I didn't handle those circumstances this way. Maybe I've been working on my own power as opposed to trusting the leading of the spirit. Maybe I uh, went too far and I was too critical. Maybe there's some, some things that he needed to confess. Maybe there's some things that he needed to cleanse from his own. He's a real human being, right? And so he, he takes this back. And for 30 days, he's going to focus on his relationship with God in a way that he wasn't able to do before. And, and yet, we see it start and then we see it in because we see the yeah, Jesus is terrified, right? Do any of you have any of those kinds of practices in your life? Do any of you? Uh, <clears throat> the reason why I'm stopping here is because I think it's really easy the way that we think theologically about God's grace and mercy is that it's really easy for me and my wife going, yeah, I really was judgmental about that. Then. Yes, I really wasn't, you know, focused in doing the loving act with it. Or maybe I let my mind wander in a place that it shouldn't like. God forgive me. And, God, and, and I'm going, God forgives me. Because that's how many times do we forgive? God's going to forgive me. It's in, endless mercy. If I truly repent and turn away from my sin and I ask for God's grace and mercy, I receive the grace and mercy of God. So I'm not just turning away from him. I'm still heading in a certain direction. This is him stopping, going, okay, I need to stop and believe you think this. I sometimes throw those little arrow prayers up of asking for God's grace and mercy because I want to be out from any guilt of, of my transgression. But I really haven't repented. I really haven't turned away from that. I just really want the grace and mercy. It's like when, when as a parent and your kids are fighting and somebody got punched and you put the two of them together and say, you say you're sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, they're not sorry. They just don't want to be in trouble any longer. So they say what they need to say. <laughs> do any of you have those places in your life where when you find yourself in a place that is maybe less than where we're going to be or maybe it's a place where you're hoping to kind of take a little leap of growth there's some things that you do there are places that you go that you sort of have that, that you put in your life that will help you uh, in terms of that we'll talk about that well, great idea <laughs> uh, I know some folks that go to DeMontreville every year to uh, do a silent retreat. Uh, I see that as kind of a short little vow where they set aside that time. Um, have any, anybody ever been to DeMontreville? I, mean, I, I did it twice. I, that's hard. That's hard for people like me. Okay, just me. Uh, but I remember I have positive thoughts about that. I had good memories of that, but I, it's funny that I don't sign up to do that on any kind of regular basis. Um, I went 26 times. Is that right? Why? Tell me about that. I, I just got into a pattern of going. And it's something I actually got the idea from Jack Husted, who mm -hmm. used to go, because his insurance partner was the head of a, of a weekend that he recruited people. So really? I started going. And it just kind of became a habit. Is there anyone know him? <laughs> no, it's out in uh, Lake Alamo, uh, Lake oh. Alamo, west, east of St. Paul. It's not necessarily far away. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. never far. Remember, we used oh. to go about a mile from there just to go snow tubing on a, on a Sunday afternoon. Is that a good by Rochester as well? I don't know. Yeah. That's the only Jesuit place here, I think. Although, I have a former business associate, a woman who just went to a Jesuit retreat somehow in the western suburbs for women. I don't know who put that on, but it was it was modeled after the Jesuit retreat sure. format. So. Would would you would you be willing to share a little bit more about your experience in, in doing something like that? Well, I, I'm not a guy who used has a lot of silence in my life. I like to have stuff going on. And so that was a good way for me to just break out. And they require that you be silent, you know, and uh, they talk at you, but you can't talk back at them. So uh, they have a priest that gives 14 little 15 minute talks over the course of 14. That. I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, well, it starts on Thursday night. And it goes through kind of Sunday afternoon. And and you can kind of feel yourself just quieting down 
oh, over the course of that time. So, I didn't remember there were 14. There are other St. John's, you know, up north here in the St. Cloud. That big Benedictine monastery up there with that big famous church and everything. Don't they do things like that? I'm sure they are. They had a retreat center, I, but I don't know if they put on retreat. I mean, you can go up down rent a room. Isolated cell. Anyone else have? Yeah. This is a holiday fast for Lent, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences. 40 days? What what was some what, what was some why was this so beautiful? Can you share a couple of thoughts? I really didn't want to get off of the path and forty eight days. Really? I I I gave up all the food. I was only drinking in prison. And I wasn't hungry even once. And I didn't feel even once. Really? Wow. Not once. It was very physically refreshing. By giving up food, did you add something to to your life? To, to, yeah, there was, was there a lot a... of prayer, and I prayed three times a day and read the Bible three times a day. And it was like I was walking on. It was it was just so relaxing. Mm -hmm. just, oh. you were in, you you were in a different. You were just at a different. I don't know, it's very difficult to explain it, but it's like a, on this long road, just going endlessly. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. very good. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there are times, uh, and I, going back to our, some of our earlier conversations today, where we can get pretty heels dug in, pretty sure. I think there are times along our life when we just need that, you know, like the etch sketch, we need to just have a little shake up, kind of clear the screen a little bit and kind of go, let me rethink some of these things. How do I how do I approach prayer? Forty days, you I don't know. Maybe you read the Bible and pray three times a day in your normal practice, okay? but but maybe that was something you added was an opportunity. Oh, that kind of shook it up. It made me three times throughout that day think about about my relationship with God and read some passages of Scripture that were either challenging or hopeful or encouraging that would infuse kind of a new spiritual understanding, a new uh, energy into my my, my I kept it focused. I had a certain focus on the entire journey. Mm. That was um, the girl that helping in, in Sri Lanka. I, I, I prayed real hard, Lord, and let the parents get to know you. Mm. So you know, it's happening. Oh. And so it's just, I'm putting my head through all everything else that I'm going through. It's unbelievable how when you really humble yourself and ask for a prayer request from God, he's listening to you. And the fact that you said that at times a reminder of that uh, place where we got confirmed that for you in your life. Uh, mm -hmm. uh appreciate that. I, I just think there are times where we have to think about how we can set aside some kind of create some space uh and maybe some new ways uh for us to to rethink, to reevaluate, to really extend, as opposed to just staying kind of on a normal routine. Um, let's uh, let's move on to the last section. We have five minutes, and we're actually going to finish our passage. Uh, oh, uh, so one of the things I think, uh, get, somebody get ready to read twenty four through twenty eight in your own heart and mind. Listen to God as He speaks. Uh, it was important for Paul to get back to Jerusalem. Anybody know why? Why was it important for Paul to get back to Jerusalem? That's headquarters. That's headquarters. Uh, that's when they talk about to, to get to the church and they're getting to Jerusalem, where you know the ministry then was was sent out from and and out to the world. And so that's where uh, kind of the authority rests. Paul goes back at certain times throughout his missionary visit to, to converse, have conversations about how do we deal with the Gentiles, how do we deal with circumcision, how do we deal with you know, a variety of questions. And so they would have conversations and dialogue. And sometimes he would kind of get himself back in line. And sometimes it would be for them to kind of have uh, their, their world and their understanding illuminated. Um, there there was, was good dialogue uh, around that. And so that's where they would have some of these conversations of how they were going to continue to perpetuate the, the, the way. Um, so it, I 
I think it's important for us to, to realize that's where he is. So someone want to read 24 through 28? Um, All right. Now there came to a teacher, a Jew named Apollos from Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public. By the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. I like the way that ends, it's showing that by the scriptures the Messiah is um, So, do we ever hear about this guy anywhere else in scripture? Paulus from Alexandria? Mm -hmm. What's that? There is one. No, I can't remember what it is. They remember. Oh, they're talking of gods. Is that the one where they're. No. But thank you for that. It's part of the. Exactly. They sometimes speculate that Hebrews do it. Very possible. Very possible. So, what's that? It's a different style than Paul. It is. It is. It's, but it's clearly someone who knew him well uh, because of the theological uh, inference that's there. So, they, so yeah, and a lot of theology is in Hebrews. A lot of theology is in Hebrews. Uh, Apollos is one of those ones that's working alongside the work that that others are doing, and so he pops up in different places. And so, and but the questions always, and the questions always for us to church today is: are, are they with us or are they against us? Uh, or or is there are are they are they uh, working in competition with us? Or are we on the same team? And it's really easy for us to to say, oh, well, they're not they're not with us with us, and so they maybe don't do it the right way, maybe they don't say it the right way, maybe they have some nuances that are different for us, and so you know, so maybe we can't really actually have good fellowship with them. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that I, my, one of my goals this year was to get to know some of the other senior pastors in this town, because I literally didn't know any of the senior ministers in this town. Mm -hmm. And so I made appointments with, like, at, uh, I think 12 now, meetings with uh, pastors in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because one thing, that we've had all kinds of really good conversations, uh, really some really good people that are working in this town, in this 15 square miles of called Indiana. Uh, but one of the things that came up in every single one of the conversations, Variety of ways they talk about this. You know, but the churches we don't do so well working together. You know, we do a lot of belly bumping. Was one of the one of the yeah the priest said. They go yeah we do a lot of belly bumping in the church. Says, yeah we don't really get along. We we let theological discuss you know, uh, theological uh, issues divide us. There was a whole way a lot of ways that we talked about it, but it was clear in all of our all of our conversation with them is that we all have an awareness of the fact that we're all the church, right? Scripture says that there's the bride of Christ, not a harem of Christ. There's the bride of Christ. There's the church, right? Yeah, we operate as if it's a harem. We operate as like because we have some theological nuance that's different. You know, as simple and ridiculous as how much water we use in baptism in, in separate. So, uh, so there's this notion that if they're not doing it exactly the way we're doing, we have to be a little suspicious of them, as opposed to saying we. We're, we're, we're headed in the same direction. We're trying to do the same things. That could expand in the ways that we think about the way other world religions are working as well. That could create a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of grace that oftentimes isn't there. But certainly it should happen within Christendom itself. But yet we find there's always uh, competitions and, and oppositions, and we can't really support and pray for you as a congregation because what if more people start going to your church than come to our church? Well, then what would they say about us? Well, again, that means we're. We're actually not caring about people coming 
to this understanding of faith and this transformation with the of God. We're more worried about our institution. Oh, well, that's a problem then, isn't it? <laughs> so what if we did start praying for each other? Uh, I drive by several churches coming to church, you know, on Sunday mornings and night. I try to remember to pray for them. I pray for the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Methodists on the way to church. Uh, wow, uh, I, I have to. After having these conversations with these people, I feel like I feel obligated to that, that, that I don't stand in opposition. Although sometimes I look in the front and I say, oh, <laughs> Anyway. Uh, but uh, on that very same text, First uh, Corinthians uh, 1. Am I for Paul or am I for Paul? And, uh, I was wondering if somebody's going to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go. And, uh, so that where's and, my allegiance? And and uh, all saying, you know, don't don't have these positions among yourself. Thank you. I was gonna I was gonna share it. I was like, I'm, I'm sure somebody in this group is going to pop that up because that, that's one of the most clearest examples. Uh, so, uh, but he doesn't have all the answers. He, he doesn't have all the right theology. He doesn't have the whole story. And so we see that these wonderful, faithful folks pull aside to try to fill in the place for him. There's some discipleship that goes on. He's doing great work. He's really encouraging the spread of the gospel. He's, he's sharing this good news, but there was still some growth. I think there's two thoughts there. One, we should never get to our place where we think we're good to go. Even though we see the fruit of the work that we're doing, we still shouldn't get to a place where we go. Good to go. That there's still things that there's still ways that I can learn. There's still ways that I can be corrected. There's still ways that I can have a better understanding of who I am and the work that I'm doing and what and the bigger and better uh, understanding of what God wants to do and continue to do. Um, and sometimes that's going to happen as we read our scriptures, as we set aside time to pray, as we just talked about. Sometimes it's going to happen because of another brother and sister that's a little bit further along the journey that it suggests. But who who has that opportunity in our life to do that? Who do we give this is what how I always describe it? Who's got permission to kick in the shins? Who's got permission to come up and say, yeah, really? Really? What are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? What what gives you that sense? What we all have to have those people that well, my mother used to always say, do you want to know when your slip was showing? She always wanted to know when her slip was showing. Back when women used to wear slips. <laughs> they, they still do. I don't know. But, <laughs> but she always would say that. She goes, I don't want to walk around with my slip. Show, make sure you show me that. And that, my brother and I both took away from that is that notion that we need other people to tell us what we can't see in our lives sometimes. We need other people to come alongside and love us enough to care about us enough that when they see us, wander off the path. Now, some people take advantage of that. Some people say, you know, I'm going to have that role in your life without being invited. <laughs> That's not really the point. The point is, who are those people in your life that you can invite into? What I also love is the fact that God was using it, even though he didn't have it all worked out. And I'm going to close with telling you two really good stories. One in Kenya and the other in Peru. Uh, when we first uh, started going to Peru years ago, we ended up spending 16 years with World Vision in Peru, doing the significant, this church doing a significant project in each of the major communities of Kikiana, Peru. Uh, it's one of the wonderful parts of the, of the life of this church in terms of my own experience. But when we, the first trip we went, of course, we didn't know we were ever going to go back. We just were going to go away by invitation of World Vision. And there's some great stories that come out of that. But one of the things we did when we were there, we met Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul was named after the Apostle Paul. Uh, he had very faithful parents where the gospel had come early uh, to that community. Uh, actually, through uh, so a wonderful Catholic priest that rode a donkey a million miles caring for his people. He, he was, I never knew he was full on down before I got there, but his stories were amazing. But Pastor Paul uh, didn't have a Bible and he didn't know how to read. But he had a significant impact on that community and he lived about 15 miles outside the town where he had his his farm so one day early in the week he would walk into town and he would stop and ask somebody do you have a bible no he would walk on do you have a bible no 
in Black Rock. You have a weapon. Yes, I have a weapon. Oh, where is it? It's in my house. Would you would you be willing to, to show it to me? And they would walk to their house and they would show them the Bible. He would open it up and he says, Do you have a favorite passage? He says, no. He says, can, can I can I ask you to do something for me? Yes. Let's just open up the Bible. And he would open up the Bible and wherever it landed, he would ask the person to read it for him. And they would read it, and they would read it two or three times. And he would thank them. And he would offer a little prayer for them in their house, in their household. And then he would walk back his 50 miles thinking about what he said. And that's how he formed his sermon every single week. For years. For years. So when I found out we were going to go back a second time, I found not only a Spanish Bible, but we also found a Quechua Bible, which is the trade, uh, Spanish is the trade language. Quechua is the actual language that we grew up with. Uh, I didn't find it. Let's be honest. The World Vision staff in Peru found it, but I asked them to find it. So we went to his church. He invited me to preach, which was awesome. And then we presented him these two, two Bibles. And what I said to him was, that, that's Paul. I will pray that God will give you the gift of tongues and it will be, <laughs> it'll be in reading. Because then you could read it. He goes, yeah, I don't know. It's a little late in my, my career to worry about this. But he says, but, but I will take this Bible with me and whoever I meet, I will ask them to read from my Bible. And he had this big smile on his face. And, and for years, and we, as we would go back, uh, we didn't see him every year that we went, but oftentimes we did. And I would go, what's your passage for today? He goes, I have not made the walk. <laughs> Which many had, had got that far. You, you get this, and it was one of those wonderful, wonderful relationships. I ran into the same thing in Kenny one time. Um, we ran into another pastor who didn't have Bible to read and did the same thing. And I thought to myself, Peru in Kenya? And that, I wouldn't have thought to do that, but I guess, you know, it, it, that's how they were, I want to get a preacher. I don't have a Bible. Uh, and I thought, even though they didn't have the ability to read, didn't have the scripture, didn't have all the tools that we think about, they were still doing great work and empowering that local community as we are to be followers of Jesus. And I think, even though he didn't have all the stuff worked out, that was still using it. And I, that's such a great encouragement to me in terms of, I mean, I don't really want to think about the broken clocks right twice a day. I don't want to go that far. But uh, but also, though, that God can use all of us in all of our shortcomings and all of our issues and concerns, God can still use it. But I think there's some things that we learned today about maybe we we show up in the world and show up in the lives of others with, with open hearts and open minds and with curiosity and wonder and grace in such a way that there would probably be much more of an openness to at least even hear what we have to say as we plant those seeds and then let God do that work. Right? In that gentle nudge of a beginning relationship with another. Anybody else want to have a final word for us today? What's the takeaway for us today? Anybody have one? <laughs> All right. That <laughs> this guy's longer. <laughs> That's great. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for this time together. Thanks for these last few weeks that we've been in Acts together and we've seen the, the work of the church early on, the work of your spirit, rising up, raising up leaders, raising up faithful people as they sought to share their news. And God, you, you, you use their work, you use their relationship, you use their efforts, you use their gifts and abilities and talents. And the gospel continue to grow. And it's still here 2,000 years later because here we are evidence of that the church is still alive. It's changing, it's being transformed every day. And we, we want to believe, we hope, we choose to believe that it's because you are leading us how we can continue to share this good news in a world that's very different and continues to be changed every day. So God, lead us, guide us, give us the wisdom and discernment and clarity that we need at times. And the grace and mercy as we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.